Welcome to another episode of Journeys in Entrepreneurship. Today, we have a Faith Foundation mentor, Dr. Ahmed Babatunde Kupola. Dr. Kupola is the Managing Director and Chief Executive Officer of CRC Credit Bureau Limited. He's a Nigerian banker, accountant, economist, entrepreneur, business development expert, and business executive. He has diverse work experience spanning the public and private sectors of the Nigerian economy, cutting across financial services, investment, public and social enterprise. CRC Credit Bureau was founded in 2008, and since then, he's led as a Managing Director and Chief Executive Officer. Interviewing him today is Razak Ahmed. Razak is the CEO and co-founder of Kauri Wise, a financial technology company digitizing the investment management industry in Africa and democratizing access to savings and investment products for the growing population of the underserved African middle class and millennials. Join us as we listen to the journeys in entrepreneurship in the financial services space. Hello, my name is Reza Kamed. In this episode of Journeys in Entrepreneurship, I will be focusing on Dr. Tunde Fukwala's rich experience working in the Nigerian banking industry and the lessons he has learned building one of the top three credit bureau companies in Nigeria, CRC Credit Bureaus Limited. Welcome to this episode, Dr. Tunde Fukwala. Thank you for having me. I'll start from your experience and in the Nigerian banking industry. I was reading through your profile and understand you initially worked in the Nigerian banking sector. Uh, so I would like to know, working in the Nigerian banking sector then, how did that experience shape what becomes Dr. Tunde Pukwola today? Thank you very much. Um, I think it's very interesting um, going through memory lane of where I started from when I joined banking. Initially, I started my career after university in the public service, but I knew that place was not meant for me. I was someone with very restless focus, and I also want to seize some actions in whatever I'm doing. So I moved to banking very early enough uh, after I became a chartered accountant. And I started with investment banking. I started my career in a merchant bank. Uh, I spent about four years there before I moved to commercial banking uh, space. And in those days, it's um, very interesting, but also very challenging compared to what we're seeing uh, today. Uh, one thing to learn is that technology has shaped quite a lot of things that we are seeing today. Uh, so the era of tally numbers uh, had gone and gone forever in, in the in, in banking industry. I remember in those days when you have a check to, 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 to cash, you then have to present that check you probably present it in the morning, take a, a tally, go back to your office, and come back in the afternoon. By that time, your check must have gone through almost 10, 12 tables, because somebody will collect that check and register it. Somebody else will check your balance. Somebody else will check your signature. Another person will check whether you are the real person that has that owned the account, and then it goes to the accountant who will always sit at the back. And then you call them head of operations today, but they are known as accountants in those days. Very powerful set of people. And those are the ones that allow you to eventually draw. And then it, your, the journey of the check, it, it, it's some journey for you to come to have cash, then come through the same, through the same process. Uh, so it's very, very significant. That's just to tell you, how we have transformed and what the experience had been like in the in the banking industry. Uh, let me also give you another uh, example in, in bearing of check. If you have a check that is written in the name of Razak and is to be paid in Sokoto, it will take 21 working days. Before you 21 can, working before days. Before you can get value. That's almost a month. It's three, it's three weeks. You get three good weeks. If it's up country, we call it up country check. If it's in Lagos or Lagos to Ibadan, that's where the bank is. Okay, so I give you a check of Zeni Bank, you lodge it in UBA Ibadan or UBA Akmobo, it will take seven days. So that's the kind of experience that uh, we had in, in those days. And of course, it's manual, uh, a lot of ledger books, uh, a lot of um, 
you know, physical movement of items and movement of prop, I mean, I mean uh, instruments uh, is what, what we, we used to see in those days. And then, of course, gradually uh, in the 80s, then, then there was a, an upsurge um, of new generation banks, uh, licensing of new banks, and that began to change the entire thing. And so the focus when I came into banking in early 1990s, I joined bank in 1991, actually, is that that was the era when the new generation banks came in and they were doing all within their powers to change the narratives when it comes to service delivery, uh, whether from uh, on the part of uh, deposit mobilization or on the part of access, access to credit. Uh, one experience I can also share with you is that the bank I work with was the first bank to do telephone banking. Oh, huh. So, how, how was so that then? The, 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 the error of that is for you to just, you know, go through a process of dialing some numbers and then you can get your balance. I and think. we were so excited, you know, because it was not a popular <laughs> thing. It was not a time when everybody had access to a telephone in the first place. So, but uh, people that have telephones in their home, you can, you can then dial uh, and then it will give you some message and then you put another code and then you get you, you get you get your you get your balance, balance. and and that's all that it, that that's we like done. USSD. Exactly, that's as well. But you know, it's on, on physical like telephone. You know, yeah, landlines. Yeah, land lines. So uh, that's that's so. If you situate that to what we are seeing today, mm -hmm. we are on your phone, mobile phone. You can just do anything. Then you know that we have we have moved full circle uh, when it comes to efficiency. It's also at the time when you come into the banking hall. And then there will be so many people, there will be chairs, table. I mean, people have to see it and all of that because it takes time for you to go through that process of, uh, you know, being serviced, either for deposit or for whatever. Nowadays, you don't need to. I oh. can't remember the last time I was in any bank to do anything. I can always do it uh, at the comfort of my home or in my office. So we have that. Even in terms of credit, that's oh. even much, that was even much more challenging. You know, you find yourself in a situation where you must know someone, either the branch manager, before, or, you, can access credit. before you can access credit, before they can even listen to you to say, I want to write an application for credit. Wow. And so it, it, it's not it was not democratized. It's not a, a situation where you can go on your laptop, you can do online, book for a credit, they can provide you, and then you can get credit. No, that was nothing like that. So it, it's very, very, even though it was not as bad as what you see in the 80s, but in the 90s and the early 2000s, you realize that it's an evolution. A lot of things are happening and they were happening very fast. Uh, so things were changing, technology was coming, but the technology also kept on disrupting itself. Uh, so, I mean, I just gave you an example of the, the telephone banking, uh, which we thought was a big thing that we have done. It was also an era when ATM came into being. And, and I remember my bank paid dearly for it. We bought a lot of ATM machines only to discover, imported them to discover that they were old edition, old fashions. We couldn't use them. You know, that was the time the banking industry was trying to now have a consortium uh, among themselves to now go into ATM uh, and, and get that company to, de to, to deploy ATM machines to various, various parts. Uh, but it didn't work out because that company didn't survive. Okay, but that, that was the time. It was also, so, so when you have that, so you can imagine that before that time, there was nothing like a, a debit card, you know. So everything was about cash. You have to ca carry your cash around and you have to go to bank to physically withdraw the cash uh, before you could do anything. So that, that was the kind of environment uh, that I started my, my career from in, in banking, you know. Awesome. Thanks so much for taking out that memory lane. Uh, I could resonate with a few of those things, even though some of them sounded like, <laughs> how did we leave? How did we leave the world yeah. then? But again, um, looking through how the entire industry has evolved from an operational standpoint, it is obvious that so many things have changed in terms of how checks, uh, how checks get cleared, how customers access uh, services. Mm -hmm. Most services currently are self-service compared yeah. to what we had. Yeah. 
Now, let's flip it. In terms of the opportunity within the banking industry or the financial service industry, how will you situate the opportunities that exist today in the financial service industry compared to the opportunities that existed then? Because then, when banks were given licenses, there were a lot of banks, yeah. right? They were focusing on a certain set of opportunities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Have we tapped all those opportunities completely? Or do we have new set of opportunities now? Okay, so that's that's very interesting. I mean, if you look at where we were coming from, um, the focus was on corporates. Okay. Uh, banks would like to mobilize deposit from everyone, okay. but then they want to give the the loans to only a fraction, a very small proportion. In fact, most of the banks, if you take their first fifty customers, they will probably represent more than ninety percent of the total loan loan book. That's, that's what we used to have. And basically, is oil and gas. It's basically oil and gas. Because at that time, there was not even telco. Telcos was not there. So as uh, technology evolved, banks have the capacity, the opportunity to now begin to go into areas the historical were not going into, you know, taking on retail loans, consumer banking, you know, uh, leveraging on technology to be able to do that. So then the era of, uh, you know, debit card came into being. Some banks even tried their hands on credit card. They got their hands burnt, uh, then they withdrew, and then credit card is coming back again. You know, but consumer loans has just become a new phenomenon. Uh, before then, even with technology, a lot of banks were still not doing consumer loans, retail loans, uh, personal loans, that the way you see it, and with the kind of um, you know am, uh, amplification that we have seen in the in the system as we speak today, so that that's been the 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 the, the, the journey, um, and I believe that we haven't seen anything. You know, I, I'm just curious to even see what what the industry will look like in the next ten years. Uh, looking at my time, I used to joke with my staff here that if I was to go back into banking today. I'll probably have to go and start as a teller because I, even though I was general manager operations, uh, with knowing a lot about operations of a bank, but that was more than 15 years ago. So things have changed. Everything has changed. You know, new things are emerging. New technology is driving a lot of things. Uh, we started cashless project then, but it does, it's not even within the contemplation of what we are seeing today that you, you can see. The cashless we had at that time was for you to go to a restaurant and be able to use the, your debit card. And then the, 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 you put uh, DPOS to, to be there. And then the issue of how do you do reconciliation and how do you get value from those companies and all of that were issues that uh, you, you were focusing on as they were emerging uh, at that time. But now, FinTech is giving a lot of, you know, stress i mean I, I won't call it stress is giving is driving the industry in such a way that even the areas that they didn't want to go into banks didn't want to go they are being forced to go into those areas now uh lending small amount of money to as many people as possible and uh, lending online you know using api and all of that initially even when in in this decade a lot of banks still didn't still wanted to keep on doing what they were doing but when they realized that they could be taken out of the market they need to have to find a way to see that this is the direction. This is where the future lies. Uh, we better have to invest, not just in technology, but also in people. Uh, I remember my bank then. We have to go and look at the case study of ICICI Bank in India. That bank was the largest retail bank in India. And so we were trying to look at their business model. How, what, what, how are, they, are they able to do what they were doing? And that became a case study for virtually all the banks that were trying to migrate to you know, retail and consumer loans, uh, you know, space uh, in Nigeria. But there's still a lot to be done. Even as we speak today, a lot of people still can't have access to credit. Credit registration is still less than 20% in Nigeria. Now, that leads me to my next question, uh, because that's a natural transition into what you're currently doing, uh, credit bureau uh, business. You built one of the three credit bureau companies in Nigeria today. I uh, would like to know what informed that decision to transition from uh, banking into credit, um, still within the same financial service industry, nonetheless, but there was a major leap 
yeah. from being a staff of a company to mm. actually driving the yeah. establishment and running of a company. Yeah. So the two questions basically are what informed the decision to focus on credit bureau business and how does that unlock additional value yeah. to the banking industry given that credit is very critical to grow the industry as a whole. Okay, so in my years in banking, I had the privilege to superintend over operations, financial control, risk management, huh. and I knew the challenges we had in bad loans, non-performing loans, people taking loans from one place and then they forget about you and then move to another place and you'll be talking to the other bank, the other bank will tell you, you know, the man doesn't even have an account with us. Meanwhile, it's not true. So there was a lot of information asymmetry uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the environment and there's this uh, haphazard, you know, challenge that everybody, that the, the industry had at that time. So I, I, will, I look at it then and say, okay, so how can we solve this problem? The only way to solve the problem is to find a way to have an infrastructure that everybody could relate to, that will have information about borrowers. Uh, and then we leverage on what is going on outside Nigeria. So there is no rocket science about this. Some countries have done it successfully. If you want to move your economy from cash base to credit base, you then have to have what you call credit infrastructure. Now, the single most important infrastructure when it comes to credit is, is a credit bureau. It's a credit reporting system. The credit reporting system is to enhance ability of, of, of lenders to share information about everybody that is borrowing in the system is to have that mindset that a predator who has hit you will always hit somebody else if you just maintain that information and you don't let it get to to, to, to another person i mean another, another bank in the industry so you have to promote information sharing you have to be able to provide your customers you have to ensure that you are lending with information and that's what motivated me to be interested in this. I see it as a complete game changing, game changer for, for, the, for the lending industry and for, for the economy of Nigeria. Yeah. There is no anywhere in the world where an economy thrives when there is no access to credit. And there's nowhere an economy is driven by credit without a very robust and functional credit reporting system. So I was really uh, enthralled with that. I'm very excited to be able to lead the initiative that will solve this problem once and for all and unlock the potential that we have in access to credit, especially for SMEs. I'm a very passionate person when it comes to SMEs. And I know this is one way to get SMEs to have access to credit. And so uh, that journey started, uh, the opportunity came, I, I, I latched out onto it. I said, yes, this is what I've always wanted to do. I wanted to do something that will liberate the economy uh, from fraudsters, uh, serial defaulters, and that will make it easy for normal people, ordinary people, you know, responsible borrowers uh, to be able to have access to credit at very reasonable price with little or no collateral at all. And that's how the, the journey started. You know, and the journey has been on since 2008 and it's not, it's, it's not been a cup of tea when, I can when, imagine it, when that. it comes to, to that, you know. I can imagine that. So um, looking at the journey, um, I want to get some insight into two important things. Uh, one is, how has the relationship been with the regulators? Um, how did you hack it such that um, you got the license to do yeah. this? Because at that point, I want to believe that um, credit infrastructure was still very new. How yeah. did you hack regulatory yeah. acceptance? Okay. That's one. Then the second is your journey so far as entrepreneur. Okay. Uh, what are the lessons, the key lessons you will want people to know yeah. about building a successful company? Thank you very much. So we started at a time when it was um, a, 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 an era of no regulation. So okay. that, and that was a very big risk to take. So what we then did was to see how we would stimulate regulator to be interested and give us a, a platform, a process, because we know that when you are use, I mean, dealing with data of people or borrowers, it's very risky. You need to have a backing of the law to be able to have a successful business when it comes to credit reporting. And so oh. the regulator becomes very important. So we, we now have to engage regulators. 
and said, give us a guide. Luckily, Section 57 of the CBN Act, you know, made a provision for CBN to be able to license and regulate activities of credit bureau, even though there was none at that, that time. Right. Okay. So we sat down with them. We worked with them to provide the first, what we call guidelines, which came out in 2008. Okay. And then that led to licensing. And that's how three credit bureaus were licensed in 2009. And so we were one of those three licensed credit bureaus. Interesting. You know. So it is, that, that's the way it started. So it was an advocacy issue for us okay. to say that let's get it. There are two ways to, to really have, have handled that. The first, the other option will, will have been for us to have an act of parliament. But we know that will be very difficult for us to do. You know, it will take years before you can get parliament to see it. Eventually, our parliament got that and then they passed a law in 2017. So you can imagine. That's more than that's, that's nine almost years. nine years, eventually, uh, which we also try to get them to do. And now there is CBN regulation guiding the operation of license credit bureaus, and there is an act of parliament in Nigeria guiding the operations of credit bureau. And so, and when you are setting up this, and as an entrepreneur, there are things you have to do well. First is to identify, is there a market? Where is the market? What's the market? What's the gap in the market? And like I said, one of the things that, you know, excited me was the fact that there was a complete challenge in the lending industry in Nigeria. A lot of banks had died. People lost deposits on account of that. But most banks that died in Nigeria were as a result of bad loans. Bad loans. So if, I'm up, if I have that opportunity, which I did have, then is to see there is a market, there is a need, there is an opportunity. And that's what is very important for anybody who wants to go into a business. Uh, there are opportunity. That opportunity can be new, like in this case, the credit reporting system, or it can be something that you want to improve upon, like some other things that happen in other spaces. If I even in credit reporting, CBR already had what you call CRMS, credit risk management system, that was not functioning. The banking stand didn't believe in it. Uh, because it was not it was not efficient like any other government owned institution. Mm -hmm. That's why private credit bureau became very attractive and the opportunities were there. As an entrepreneur, do you have is there a need? Because if you have to bring value, that value must be something that people will appreciate and they are going to ready to be ready to pay for it. Right. The second thing is now to begin to look at what's the size of the market? Nigeria mm -hmm. is a big market, you know. Uh there are there are 89 banks, 90 banks came into 24 banks, but they became bigger banks. Yeah. There are 200 million people. Uh, there are less than 20 million borrowers in Nigeria at that time. So I saw all of that as opportunity. Though what we should be able to do as a credit bureau is to incentivize lending, is to stimulate lending in the economy, is to democratize access to lending so that everybody who wants to borrow can really be able to borrow. Wow. You know, so that, that that so we saw that opportunity there. We did a feasibility studies and we did a business plan thereafter. And we saw that's the best way to go. So the second thing is how to then put everything together from paper to become a reality. Now, becoming a reality has to do with looking for people who can work for you, looking for partners who can work with you, looking for infrastructure that have to leverage upon. So in the case of the credit bureau, infrastructure is very key. Raising capital, because it's a highly capital intensive business is very key. And then of course, the people, because it's always IT driven inst institution. So you have to look for people, IT of all shades, mm -hmm. database people, software people, um, yeah, and data managers, statistician, data analysts. You have to look for all those people. And you know, these are these are not you know uh, professions that are very very common. Even now that they are common, a lot of them don't want to stay here. Yeah, you know, they run away from from the country, so it's, it's a very very difficult thing. So, but what I'm driving at is that as an entrepreneur, you need to know the kind of people you need, and you have to find a way to really get them to work for you. You need funding. In our own case, we needed huge funds because we have to have an infrastructure. Okay, we have to have a partner. We have never done this before, and we know that other people, in all other some other countries have done it successfully well. So there's no point for us to try to reinvent the wheel. Let's just go and meet one of them and bring that application that they're using and bring it to Nigeria. And that's precisely what we did. But that comes at a cost. And oh. so we have to find a way to do, we did road shows to raise money, uh, to get the financial institution to be interested in what this is all about and to put money down 
to be able to support the takeoff of, of the infrastructure. If you are running a database uh, like we are doing, you need a main data center, you need a mirror data center, mm -hmm. you need electricity. You've seen what has happened even here today. So you have the main electricity, you have another backup, you have a second layer of backup because people will have access to your database 24 seven. And you have to have very good as internet access that anybody can relate to at any point in time. So you need the market and you should be able to identify the market, the size of the market and where you want to play in the market. You need people, HR, human resources that will work for you uh, and be able to motivate them to be able to work for you and stay. Because the other thing is that if you get people and they keep on leaving your organization, recruitment is very expensive. You know, very, so very. it's better for you to be able to motivate the people you have, you know, have a very good package for them and then they stay uh, for some time before before they leave. And of course, you need the infrastructure for in our own case is the IT infrastructure that is very important for the business we do. And we invested heavily on that. If you need partners, you have to go and look for the partners. We need a, a partner. So we, we leverage on Don and Bradstreet. We even okay. call in the IFC at a time to be our consultant. Uh, to be able to see that we set up and have a world class, the best uh, in Africa. That's the, that's the focus. And, and that's, that's, that's another thing about, about business. You have to think very big. You have to be very ambitious. You have to look at the future with a high level of optimism and hope and ambition. Uh, for us, we want to be the biggest credit bureau in Africa, in South Africa. And I think we think we are almost getting, getting there. It's only South Africa that we believe is still ahead of us and probably Egypt. Uh, in a few years' time, we believe that with the population we have, with what we are doing currently and getting a lot of institutions, I will speak to the over 2,000 institutions, are customers of CRC. That's you can, Yeah, so, so you can then see that uh, we, we are there. I mean, and, and we can always get, you know, um, uh, we can always get people, uh, get institutions to, to, to believe in us. Uh, we can get everybody now to now lend. So the era of lending in the dark is gone in Nigeria. Oh. Uh, everybody now lend by profiling their customers, whether those customers are corporate or individual. Oh. We can see quite a lot of products, loan products, in various ways that are now in the market. It's courtesy of credit bureau. Or it's courtesy of what we are able to oh. do in the market. But again, is still, it is, we are still in the morning stage. We are still in the early stage of developing a huge credit reporting infrastructure in Nigeria. Because what happens is that when you have a product and you are an entrepreneur, if the market is not ready, you have to find a way to stimulate the market to be ready. And demand, I mean, readiness can be, your product can be demand uh, following or supply leading. In our own case, it's supply leading. We are the one bringing the product to the market. A lot of the lenders don't even know whether they need, the, they need the product. So uh, when you do that, to get your customer to say, this product is good for you, is a lot of work. It is. It's a lot of work because you have to let them see that it's good for you. This, this medicine is good for you. You have to take it to make you <laughs> healthier. And then that may mean in the lending space, for our own example, them changing a lot of processes in-house for them to be able to use that. Let me just give you a, a simple example. If you're talking about credit score, hmm. Nigerian banks didn't know anything about credit scoring solution. Those of them who knew about credit scoring were using internal scoring solution. So, but if you want them to adopt scoring, scoring solution, which enable them to learn to anybody who is qualified, irrespective of whoever that person is, is the machine that will be doing the, the pre-qualification. Just give an instruction. Anybody that has this digit, that has 600 or 700, those are the people you should learn to. Cool. The machine will do it for you. That's what credit scoring scoring is all about. So it takes away the issue of uh, lending with emotions uh. or lending to only people you know and then excluding people that are, should benefit. But then, of course, they don't benefit because they don't know anybody. Okay. That will never happen okay. again. Definitely. There's a lot of value being unlocked by building uh, credits uh, infrastructure for the Nigerian banking industry and my next question would be that you've you've had experience that traversed private sector and public sector and then entrepreneurship um, if you had to pick one key thing as a major difference 
uh, between a public sector life and private sector life, uh, what would that be? So I think what I would pick is the sense of urgency we have in the private sector. Okay. Because um, I started my career in the public sector. I couldn't, re I couldn't just, even as a young person in my 20s, I knew I didn't belong to that place, uh, to the public sector as it was then. Uh, very slow for my, for my own liking. And then, of course, not well motivated by pay. And then I moved to the banking industry. And then from banking industry, I went back to the public sector, this time to head a para startup called Abuja Enterprise Agency, which more or less I ran like a private sector institution uh, because I was given the freedom to set it up. And the whole essence was to relate even with the private sector people because Abuja Enterprise Agency was about stimulating SMEs, was about stimulating, getting people to be interested in running their business and, you know, supporting them to be able to, 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 to come up with that. And then from there, I saw an, a bigger opportunity to provide this kind of service in credit reporting to Nigeria, and I, and I came in here. So that sense of urgency, I, I like it. I like the sense of the fact that I can see that I'm providing what I call service that has meaning. It's like an, a, a purpose for me. It's like a, it's, it's a passion for me to see, can I do something that I can really be very happy that this is the way it's transforming lives. Mm. I see that efficiency clearly. Even in Abuja enterprise agents that are around, 8 a.m. in the morning, I will be the first person in the office. I will leave oh. around 8 p.m. I will be the last person in the office. People, that's my life. That's that's private sector orientation. That, that, that's, that was what banking has done to me. You know, very active to want to get results, result orient, oriented, uh, you know, kind of life you know, service delivery, efficiency, you know, those are the kind of things that I, 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 say, I could say distinguishes uh, my own experience in, in, the, in the public sector with, with the private sector. I know that even in the public sector, there are a few people who try to run like they, 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 they are very busy, they, they're trying to get things done, they try to get results and so on and so forth. But overall, when we're looking at the, the law of averages, average. yeah, mm. you, you see that uh, the private sector is where I belong. That's, uh, that's, that's where I belong. That's quite fascinating. Uh, going through memory lane, um, your experience in banking, what inspired you know, the establishment of CRC, Credit Bureau, and the impressive feats you've achieved so far. Uh, those are quite impressive insights for me. And more importantly, the insights, you know, comparing how life is uh, in the public sector and private mm. sector, that sense of urgency. Um, I think it's something we'll both agree on. Yeah, so that, <laughs> that, that, that's very interesting. But it's good to also talk about you. I mean, you have, uh, you know, started something very interesting, uh, Kauri Wise, um, you know, as a company, and you're talking to young people to save, to invest, mm. and this is this is very this is very good for me because I know that financial inclusion is still a major issue in Nigeria. A lot of people still have talent with banking and all of that. But you have so how did you come about focusing on that niche market? Because I see it as a niche market, mm. focusing on young people, focusing on savings and investment. And what has been your experience uh, so far? So far. Yeah, thanks. I think we're just taking the baton from you. <laughs> <laughs> I put it that way. So, um, so what we do basically is to um, democratize access to savings and investments. Uh, from the experience you've shared, for example, with us, we know that Nigerian banking sector has evolved um, over the years, uh, but not so much has been done on the investment side. Like um, we really have investment management firms that are as big as banks, for example. Yeah. In the financial service industry, banking has done a bit, um, relatively, even though they've done more than 100 years, we still have a lot to do. Mm. But compared to what investment management firms have done, yeah. banks have done really, really well, mm. right? So there's still a lot that remains undone in the investment management space. And those things bother on access, limited access, um, limited financial education. For example, an average Nigerian might not even understand what mutual fund is, yeah. might not understand mm -hmm. how investment yeah. works. And it is very essential that people have solid understanding of those things before mm -hmm. they can actually invest in them. Sure. 
So our focus on the young people is just a natural outcome mm -hmm. of the demographic structure of Nigeria. Fantastic. Uh, on the average, Nigerian median age is 19, 19 years, years old. Yes, yes. So if you put out messaging how there, mm. it, the likelihood is very high that the young people will resonate more with it. it. So it's just a natural outcome of okay, what the Nigerian so demographic is. How do you then deal is. with the issue of um, education? Because I know you are technology enabled, uh, yep. the enabler for you is technology. technology yes. uh, we still have a lot of people when it comes to technology, they are scared, even though a lot yeah. of people are using the telephone. What is your company doing in that regard so that you can get as many people as, as possible, possible. Into, into it? Yeah, so um, we're leveraging on what is currently available in terms of people having access to um, smartphones and people having access to online content. Um, the way we approach financial education is not from a one-on-one -on -one or face-to-face -face approach. It's largely in terms of the experience we create. So in the product experience, for example, there is a lot of financial education content in there that enables people to be able to access the product in a way that they will understand. Okay. So in using terms, for yeah. example, investment terms, we stay away from using technical terms that require someone to go Google before they understand it. It's a whole lot of work really, because some things are just difficult to dummy down. Yeah. But that's the major work we take okay. uh, to ensure that people go through the app, people go through array of investment options, why they understand exactly what they're doing without yeah. necessarily taking the pain to ask mm. questions. That's how old is Carry right. Right. So um, we started um, better in 2017. Oh, okay, so uh, it's, still, it's still young. So it's still I, I believe you'll have learned one or two lessons even with within four years of uh, 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 you know existing. I think you are growing very very fast. But yeah. I still want to see what does the future look like for you in, in calorie wise. Yeah. So um, I think we're still very in early days. You mentioned that earlier, and <laughs> I, you know I caught it. Um, the beauty of it is that. I'm look, when you look at the Nigerian banking industry, and that's one thing we use as Yastic, there are about 45 million unique bank verification numbers. Yeah. Like, so technically, we can say Nigerian banking industry as a whole has about 45 million users. And when you look at the investment management industry, including um, mutual funds, mm -hmm. they, they don't have a million users. Wow. Right. So that means we have a lot of people having access to banks, mm. banking services. Mm. And when I say banking services, I'm talking about payments. Mm. You being able to receive money and being able to spend money. Yes. But when it comes to long-term planning of saving for the long term, yes. investing for the long term, mm. we still have limited access. The only saving grace we've had as a country mm. is the pension act yeah. that was enacted in 2006, 2005, mm. uh, thereabouts. That was the major reasons why we have about 10 million Nigerians today who have pensions. So interesting. So, but a lot of people of your generation are doing quite a lot in the space of technology yeah. and fintechs and all of that. Hmm. And I know quite a lot are still interested in, Doing in coming to that. So what lessons have you learned that you think you can give on to these people who are looking forward to coming into this kind of space? I think the there are two major lessons. One is um, speed matters and speed okay. can kill too. Right. <laughs> <laughs> speed matters a lot in this era because things change very fast. Okay. But why speed matters, one needs to be one needs to be very guided in terms of the kind of speed you want to take on and the direction of that speed. Right. So you can execute very fast, you can you can you can ideate very fast, but if you are ideating on something that is ephemeral in nature, solving yeah. a problem that is not a real problem, mm. then the industry will just you know disrupt you, and then you get disrupted. Mm. Then the second part is trust. Uh, trust takes time to, to build, build, right? So yeah. one needs to be patient with oneself when it comes to trust because it is the backbone of building an online business or mm. technology-enabled business okay. generally. Thank you very much. That's, that's, that's very interesting. I guess uh, when people listen to, to, to you, they will have pick one, one or two things. And I think we are in the best of times in Nigeria, even though the environment looks a bit scary uh, for entrepreneurs. You know, the advent of BVN, uh, yeah. NIM, I mean, NIN, 
all those means of education were part of the major challenges that we had in yeah. those days. And now you are the, also at the junction of where technology is disrupting even technology, exactly. you know. So uh, new technology, more efficient technology is coming every time. So it's very exciting time for anybody who wants to, to come into financial services space. And of course, even this Nigerian government has liberalized you know, so many things. So, many things. Yep. so if it's for a microfinance bank you want to do, you can do that. If it is a fintech you want to do, yeah. you can do that. If it's money lenders license that you need, you can do that. If it's a commercial banking you want to, even if it's, um, you know, non-interest banking that you, want to, that do, you yeah. want to do, you can you can do that. All those opportunities were not there. And of course, asset management companies are there that have a lot of latitude yep. on, on what they can do and what, and what they can really put into the market. And because the population is huge, and I don't want us to keep on talking about potentials. Let us begin to realize the potentials the potential. now. No. Yeah. Uh, and the demographic is favorable. You know, when you have demographic, just like you've said, of, of these young people having almost about 60%, then the future looks so, so fantastic. Yeah. And I think everybody who really wants to do something, there's always something that you can really you can do with do. your life uh, in Nigeria yeah. moving forward. Thank you so much for, for this insightful episode. And um, this is bringing this episode to an end. Overall, we've gone through memory lane from the 80s to 90s to see how Nigerian banking industry was at that point and how the Nigerian banking industry is today. Comparing the two historical, <laughs> historical epoch actually yeah. shows that so many things have changed in terms of how banking was run then and now banking is being run today. But one thing still remains that the opportunity is still very huge. Yeah. The major problems have not been fully solved. Yeah. So there are still a lot of opportunities for entrepreneurs, mm. for businesses to keep solving and to keep creating value. I hope you have, keep, you have picked one or two things from this insightful episode. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Tunde Pukwola. It's my pleasure. Thank you, Razak. Thank, Thank you so much. much. Thank you for listening to this episode of Journeys in Entrepreneurship. This interview was recorded on the 25th of September 2021 at the CRC Bureau Office in Lagos. We look forward to hearing about your haha moment in the comment section below and invite you to join us next week Friday for a new episode.